So, like I just said a couple of minutes ago, uh, welcome to this usually off Tuesday for us. Uh, but we had changed our schedule around in October, and uh, and our speaker Diana was going to come in, come in here on this night, and uh, getting the toward the late October, and you know what, Melanie Tracy, this is my favorite time of year, and uh, I'm muted, but I said mine too. Uh, yep. Yeah. So uh, I have a how. Halloween theme uh, story for you all tonight. Uh, instead of any jokes, this is actually a true story I'm going to tell you about about Halloween. Um, many of you know my wife is now a retired minister, and she doesn't really care too much about what Halloween is. But anyway, uh, years ago, your county parks uh, used to do Scream in the Park in one of our parks, and we had a lot of fun and did a lot of scared. I could write a whole book on this, but uh, one particular Saturday night, um, two teenagers, two teenagers from her church was were coming through in a group, and I uh, told Lou Ann, my wife, uh, what, you know, um, that uh, these two brothers are coming in this next group. So she, uh, she, my, uh, she does an awful good noise okay and uh and scares the heebie-jeebies out of everybody anyway uh she 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 saw the two brothers and she scared them very well and they went running up the trail saying words i can't even spell yeah. but the next day in church they came over to me after church they came over to me and said man that was a great trail last night you know we you know a lot of fun and all this and my wife came over to him and said, well, I was there too. And they said, where were you at? And she made this noise. Her uh, noise. And uh, they knew immediately that they had sworn at the minister uh, on the trail. So uh, her face is kind of got red from the neck up like a thermometer. Uh, so that was kind of a humor story. So, Mel, you have a favorite Halloween story? Uh, I don't know if I have a favorite Halloween story, but it is my favorite season. Really big on chocolate. I do love it. But I'll have jokes for you instead. Uh-oh. Okay. Okay? Since you don't have any, we can't go an episode without cracking at least one joke. Okay? So, what is a baby ghost's favorite game to play at Halloween? I have no idea. Peekaboo. Good one. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Got one more. I got one you, more. I'll give you two points. Who, <laughs> who gives Dracula the most candy on Halloween? Hmm. I don't know. His fan club. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. Thank you very much. I learned from the best. You must, yeah, you, you must be learning from me. Uh, <laughs> no, very good. So, uh, okay, well, let's get started with our intro. We have a couple guys here that want to say, plug some things before uh, Diana takes off with her program. So, uh, we'll get started here with all, all this. So, I think we don't have a, I think uh, we have all veterans back in here tonight. Uh, but uh, again, welcome to uh, October, middle of October uh, type of uh, Zoom, Zoom rock room. And you've met Melanie Tracy already and and me as, as Jerry. Go ahead, Melanie. All right. As always, uh, we are sponsored graciously by Lair Architecture in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, uh, designing for the future. Once again, we say thank you uh, for their continuous support of this program and send me an email and uh, say hello if you would like. Okay, we can't forget Andrew. Uh, due to technical difficulties or some switching around of Zoom, Andrew did do a, a video to be shown tonight, but uh, we're having some technical issues getting that shown the way that I used to show it. So we need to work on that uh, technology here so we can uh, 
maybe show it at our next Zoom in actually only two weeks away. Uh, but uh, all that Andrew does for not only the Zoom rock room, but his involvement with the Central Pennsylvania Rock and Mineral Club and the other clubs uh, regionally, uh, he spends a lot of time uh, making things uh, work out, make things comfortable for all the other rock hounders out there. So I personally want to thank Andrew for what he does. Uh, I'll take this one. Um, I'll plead with you one more time. Uh, the Institute in Waynesboro are wrapping up, getting toward the end of their capital campaign to uh, to raise up to raise money for their new 40 acre property that they have purchased and all the uh, improvements that are being planned. I brought you up to date on that last time, that last Zoom about all the plans and uh, things that are going to be happening at, at the Institute's property in Waynesboro. So check out nature and culture institute.org. Um, and uh, if you have a few extra uh, dollars hanging around at the end of the month, uh, don't be afraid to send them the, just a couple of dollars to get into their capital campaign because uh, it's a very, very energetic group and they are going to make this uh, new property really, really great in the next couple of years. Melanie. Your thing already, Crystal Cove Collective. Um in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is one of our sponsors as well. Um, they're also located in Thomasville. So either one of those areas, you know, feel free to uh, send them a message, stop by. Uh, we appreciate their support as well during this program. Okay, our schedule uh, coming together into the future. You might see it, we're now into actually through January. Hey, the next one, as I said, is actually only, in only two weeks from the, to tonight. And you really don't want to miss this program. It, uh, this Dean Rocchio, uh, I've actually met through uh, PA Rock County on Facebook. And I've come to learn that he is a teenager. And he is very, very sharp with his fossils of, uh, of uh, Pennsylvania, particularly the uh, Devonian and what he's going to be talking about with the Ordovician. Uh, a very bright individual. You know, he's going to be uh, presenting your program for you, uh, our program for us in uh, two weeks, November 7th, okay? Uh, November 21st, uh, I'm going to do the Geology of York County Real, uh, Heritage Rail Trail. And then uh, December 5th, Andrew is going to be with us to talk about Herkimer Diamonds and the Mohawk Valley Mining District. Our annual holiday trivia online party will be December 19th. And then we'll get into January and the January 2nd because it's just after the holiday. Nobody wants to be a special presenter. So uh, I will do some geologic highlights of the year 2023, kind of a year in re review. And thanks to our speaker tonight, Diana Geist. Uh, she actually uh, got this Shane Fern uh, to uh, come forward and wants to do a program on the Vermont granite. Uh, and that's where he kind of works. Okay. So, uh, Shane's going to give us a great program about the Vermont granite, uh, and what makes it so special. So whole way through uh, January, uh, some good, some pretty good programs, but November 7th is going to be a special night anyway. Uh, but, uh, Gonna be a great program with uh with this uh dean uh tom smith i ask you to say something about this okay i guess i'm here now you're here uh, okay i had to unmute uh yeah it's been a, i have a lot of interest people uh calling in and uh just are emailing me and I'm very interested it's people setting up outside and it's just five dollars to set up outside, five dollars per table inside, and I have people uh, talking quite a lot about uh, coming, and uh, we just never know what's going to be there. That's what makes it so good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. 
and the weather's going to be great. So uh, yes, yes, that's a big deal because the last time it wasn't. That's right. <laughs> and we have a new field truck that has a real variety of uh, foods, and we'll have it right next to the pavilion. Okay. So it's always hard to get a food truck. They're very independent. All right. I may be showing, I may be showing up there. I'm not sure what's going on Saturday quite yet. Okay, thank you. All right, and somebody who is going to be there set up is uh, our friend Steve Lindbergh. Uh, he's going to be there uh, as a vendor. But Steve, I want you to talk about the symposium again, real quick. Oh, yep, I'm here. Yeah, so I'll be at the mineral show on Saturday. Also, um, we get try to get there nice and early. We'll be set up. I've been selling a lot of my collection off but anyway a bigger event well not a bigger event but an event just as important um <clears throat> on uh beginning on friday november no friday november 10th to sunday november 12th uh the pennsylvania chapter of the friends of mineralogy is holding their annual symposium here in johnstown at the pit johnstown campus uh we have the living and learning conference center the two main uh halls rented out uh, Friday is, uh, Friday evening is just, a kind of a social get together at the sleep in hotel, uh, which is about a mile uh, from the campus. Uh, and then for registered, if anyone shows up Friday evening, uh, we're going to go over to the geology department, take a tour. We've got some stuff to give out. And then, uh, beginning Saturday morning, we have a mineral show. We've got about five different vendors coming in. Uh, the geology club will be set up there. The mineral show goes from, I believe, nine to six in the evening. Uh, Brittany will be there. Uh, the geology club, we've got some other people coming in. Um, rocks, minerals, fossils. Uh, and then the symposium is in the other half of the hallway. We've got a big screen projector. It covers the entire wall. There's a seating for about 60 to 75 people. There's a, a silent auction. We've got uh, guest speakers talking about Pennsylvania geology, Pennsylvania minerals, and some new recent discoveries. Two of our students are presenting. Um, and then same thing Saturday evening, little social get together, go back over to the geology department. Uh, Sunday for members that are registered. Uh, Sunday is a, we meet at campus at 930 and there is a field trip to the new Paris limestone quarry about a half hour uh, from campus and I'll be going over there sometime within the next week to open up the trails and cut away some brush but there's uh, a calcite fluorite some minerals to collect there there's lots and lots of fossils chance to find trilobites and um, that's going to be really really exciting to have Dean I believe his last name Ruko right have Dean Ruko as the speaker November 7th right. because last spring uh, Dean Rucco heard that I was bringing a group. It might have been Franklin County Rock and Mineral Club to that quarry. And he uh, texted me and said, hey, um, he introduced himself and said, um, boy, I'd like to come along and look at those rock layers because they look real familiar to the stuff that's up in New York, the Silurian units in New York. Uh, <clears throat> so he showed up at the quarry and within a half an hour, he found five Eurypterids, uh, <laughs> not whole ones, but parts of Eurypterids. So he may speak about that on November 7th. I know it's not part of Swatara Gap, but we never knew there were Eurypterids in the new Paris quarry. Huh. And uh, we're looking at, uh, we're going to combine with Dean now. We're going to probably publish a paper on that. Uh, okay. So the the layers in the upper Silurian, they are very similar to what we see up in New York uh, where they uh, find the Eurypterids. So an interesting find. I uh, never, ever expected to see Eurypter is there, but he was pulling them out of the rock. So, <laughs> and he knew exactly what to look for. And when I found out he was a high school student, <laughs> yep. I, I was absolutely flabbergasted. Uh, <laughs> he knows more about Eurypter than I could ever, ever hope to know. So, um, yeah, that'll be an interest. That'll be a great evening. So, um, if anyone, Jerry, what I'll do is the Friends of Mineralogy, the new newsletter just came out. So I will take snapshots of the first three pages and I'll email them to you later tonight. And then if you want, you can distribute them to the group, but it's got some updated information about the speakers and everything. So, okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the time. Yep. We'll do that. All right. Thank you, Steve. And that's the end of our, end of our introduction there anyway. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh,
Um, that's about all I have to really announce to oh, Paul Figley. Uh, you have an announcement you want to make, yes, sir. Yeah, can can everyone hear me? My computer froze and I had to restart. I'm on my cell phone right now. You're good. You're good. Okay. <clears throat> well, anyway, I thought I'd let everybody know um, whether you are part of it or not. WPSU, that's the PBS station out of Penn State and State College, does a TV series called Keystone Stories. And yesterday they posted their latest episode. It's on state parks. And I wanted to uh, let you know about it because I'm one of the speakers that's in this episode. It talks about state parks, but really focuses on the work of the Civilian Conservation Corps in the parks. And uh, there's several park people in it. And uh, of course, uh, I'm in it as well. Uh, even though I'm retired from parks, I still work as a historian with them. And um, so it's a very nice episode. I will be honest, I have not seen the full thing yet, um, but uh, it's free. You do not have, it's not behind a paywall. You can freely stream it. Uh, where you can find it, go to the website, WPSU.org. And then scroll down a little bit. Uh, when I looked it up here a short while ago, it was right on the front page when you go to it. But look up Keystone Stories in the episode called State Parks. It's about a 26-minute episode. Hmm. And I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay. Very good. Thanks for those community announcements. Anybody else? Anybody else would, would ever have any announcements you want to make? Uh, don't be bashful about this. This is one way to get the word out around uh, with our Zoom rock room. So, uh, hey, Mel, it's just not. It, it's just doesn't feel right for me not to tell a joke. See, I thought so. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. why is it so hard for vampires to make friends? I don't know. Because they're always a pain in the neck. <laughs> I like it. I thought you were going to tell me they smelled like garlic or something. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> let me hang up there. Uh, all right. I, I, I just see in the news today, I just have to say this, uh, that somebody is illegally using rocks on Interstate 83 in Northern York County, throwing a Throwing rocks off the bridge, hitting cars. It happened again uh, Saturday night around midnight, I heard today. Uh, a rock about the size of a softball smashed a window on a on a car. And luckily it did not hurt anybody, but it's, uh, of course, startled the uh, people in the car. And uh, state police are investigating and they, they actually do have some footage uh from an area traffic cam so uh anyway all right we're gonna move on uh to our program tonight and uh this should be good she's uh, diana geis has actually been i think a member of the zoom rock room since it's uh start yeah that's true and uh i've known diana and her husband roger for many years and uh I kind of watched Diana grow up and become a school teacher. Uh, I don't want to call her a, a late bloomer, but she uh, she got mm -hmm. she she raised the family first, and then she decided I want to become a school teacher. And uh, she's just uh, talented the whole way around. Like I said, she's gotten us uh, several of our Zoom rock room speakers uh, on the schedule. And uh, last year, she did a program about their drive across the country using Rock D app, which I hope all 30, uh, 25 of you that are in the room tonight have used Rock D. But anyway, tonight, uh, my friend Diana is going to uh, talk to you about uh, the uh, uh, notes on the glacial Na Glacier National Park and other points to the West, or in the West, I should say. So... Uh, I know this is going to be an interesting program. I did preview it yesterday, but uh, Diana, it's all yours. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. You're good to go. There you go. Okay. All right. 
Well, uh, welcome to Rock Room tonight, everybody. Um, I uh, found this um, quote here by Will Durant, civilization exists by geological consent, a consent subject to change without notice. So there you go. Uh, yeah, we um, sometimes, you know, we think we have things planned out, but Mother Nature has some surprises for us occasionally. <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, the first thing I want to do is um, I want to invite everyone in the room tonight to share uh, resources that you uh, like to use in, in your learning journey in geology. Um, I, I still feel like quite the neophyte. There's so much to learn. And um, I have a few resources that I, I really like, and I wanted to share those with you. Um, if you're, I don't know if you might be familiar with the great courses or Wondrium, uh, they have a uh, course posted right now called uh, How the Earth Works. Um, it's narrated by uh, Michael E. Y. Session, a professor at Washington University in St. Louis. I think it's a particularly good course, and it brings, for, for me, it's brought a lot of things together uh, in, in learning. Um, uh, you, you have bits and pieces, and it's really great when things start connecting, and you're and you're starting to see a, a bigger picture. Um, I, of course, learned about Pennsylvania geology, and until two years ago, when we uh, took our first trip on the ground out west, um, my world was Pennsylvania geology. And uh, having done these two trips on the ground out west, I certainly have a, a much uh, a, a, a huge appreciation of the geology uh, across the entire country. Um, and uh, this course helps bring some of that together. I uh, especially was surprised to learn in this course the role of water um, in the recycling, in the rock cycle. Uh, certainly we know about water in the, you know, the, the weather and you know, cycling, but it, it plays a huge role in the rock cycle. And I, I did not know that. So um, I wanted to share that. Also, um, NOVA is running right now, um, the ancient earth. They're showing it on Wednesday nights on WITF. They've already shown a couple of those, uh, but you can get on the NOVA website and watch them anytime you want on your computer. Um, I, I wanted to share this with you too. Um, deep space is a concept that they they rolled out quite some time back, and I think it does help give people an idea of of the vastness of space. Uh, uh, deep time was a concept of, uh, first described in 1788 by a uh, Scottish geologist James Hutton, although it was only coined as a term. Um, 200 years later by American author James McPhee. Um, people tend to have a poor understanding of large numbers. Many people do not have a firm grasp on the powers of 10 and the relationship among numbers such as uh, 1 million. People struggle to distinguish between millions and billions. So I found this activity online. Um, it doesn't have a URL because it's posted as a PDF. But if you... Uh, it would type in geologic time scale museums of western colorado lesson one geologic time will pop up for you and this is what i did uh, it tells you how to lay this out using centimeters as you measure along so this is my sidewalk in front of my house and it runs way way uh, up past the mailbox <laughs> and uh it really was a a, a great visual to um show this huge expanse of time that we're talking about and the history of the earth. So I want to, want to share that with you. A couple of other resources I, I really like to use are Google Earth, where you can zoom into any location. And Earth Viewer is another app I really like. Now with Earth Viewer, as you see on this, you can move this, this uh, bar up and down and the globe responds to show you what it looked like during the time period. So 
So that uh, I really like that resource also. And now uh, we'll get into Rock D. Um, please post any resources you really like to use in the chat tonight. Um, I think we'd all appreciate learning what resources so we can use to continue on our learning journey. All right, Rock D. Uh, I'm going to just say a few words about that because I use that heavily when we travel. Um, this was the beginning of our trip here as we were driving across the plains to get to the West. It takes a little while, uh, but that was my first uh, screenshot. All right. Now, uh, when I use Rock D, I know I talked about this uh, last time, but I just want to do a quick review of it. Um, I take screenshots as we travel. And uh, on the left, you'll see the screenshot. That's the Rock D uh, dashboard. And then I, I frequently take a, a, a screenshot of the map, which is uh, on most screens, it's in the lower left on the, on the dashboard. If you hit maps, then you would get uh, the Rock D map in the middle. You can pinch it to expand or collapse. So you can get right in close and it shows you exactly where, you're, where you are. And um, sometimes I also do the uh, paleo which shows you what, what the earth was like at that time. So those are all screenshots. And um, on the Rock D dashboard, um, they, don't they don't have the date. Now, here's, a, here's, a, uh, here's what I did. Here's a, what I do. I take, took a picture. I, I, I put this one in here because we drove past York, Nebraska. Uh, and I, I took the photograph. That's what I do. I usually take a photograph and then right away I go to the dashboard, take a screenshot and I go to the map, which is right here. And I take a, I often um, expand it a little bit so I can see that tells me exactly where we were when we saw this. Now you'll see up here that uh, Rock D uh, has the time on it, but it doesn't have the date. However, of course, when you take a screenshot and it's in your photographs, then you also have the date. So I can go back through my photographs and uh, match these things up so that I know, you know, well, this is where we were. This is, this is what we were driving over. And this is exactly where we were on the map. So that's how I use uh, Rock D. Okay, the first thing, the first uh, place we visited, uh, uh, on our way out. Well, I should tell you that our children had the idea that we should all meet at Glacier National Park this summer. And we were uh, getting there by different means. Some drove, some flew, and uh, we were all to meet out there. So Roger and I have a um, small motor home and we drove uh, out and uh, I wanted to make sure we could get out there in plenty of time. So when, once we arrived at the West, I planned it so that we would have a several days uh, in front of meeting the children to poke around and see what we could find. So these are some of the things we did before we got to Glacier. Uh, well, we, we went to agate fossil beds. We kind of fall across these places because as when we're driving along, I say, well, this is the route we're going to follow. I look on, on my phone and see, well, what's to see around here? And uh, we tend to find some more out of the way places, but to us, um, they're just as jaw dropping and uh, as as some of the places that um, everybody seems to go to. So this was the ag agate fossil beds. Uh, the park takes its uh, U.S. National Monument near Harrison, Nebraska. It takes its name from thin lenses of agate in the area, which range in color from amber to light gray. The main features of the monument are the valley of the Neobara River and the bluffs above the river. Now you can see uh, the bluffs here. This is a, a, a kind of a low plain with the very short grass, but these bluffs are peppered all over the plain. In the last 5 million years, the high plains have continued to uplift to their current elevation of about 4,400 feet. And the savannas, which uh, were once there, have changed to the grasslands of today. During the uplifting process, rivers and streams have meandered across the plains and eroded sedimentary deposits forming the bluffs and valleys that we see today. The site is best known for a large number of well-preserved Miocene fossils. 
Uh, that's about 20 to 16.3 million years ago, many of which were found at dig sites on Carnegie Hill, at Carnegie University Hills. Uh, some of these fossils then, of course, are in the Carnegie Museum. A major drought occurred uh, in the agate area during the early Miocene. It is believed that when many of the drought-stricken and exhausted animals came to the remaining water holes in an effort to survive, the animals collapsed and died in and around the water. Uh, as the muddy water dried, the fossil beds were formed. Agate's older fossil layer is about 21 million years old and covered by a layer of ash, and its younger bed is about 20 million. Um, so what it is, uh, they found this fossil bed uh, with just uh, piles of um, animal bones. So they believe it was a watering hole and the animals came there and, and died. Here's one of the pretty awesome creatures that um, they found there. Um, I, I took a look, I didn't take a uh, photograph of, of this jaw and that is a quite an awesome and fearsome creature with this, uh, this jaw here. Um, I also, I was, uh, here's the ancestor of the dog that they had down below living in a, a tunnel or, or under the ground at that time. Hmm. Uh, next we visited Fort, Fort Laramie. Now, of course we did the historical stuff as well, but um, as far as the geology, Fort Laramie was built on a terrace cut into uh, quaternary floodplain deposits associated with the Laramie River. Terrace gravel deposits can be as deep as 20 feet. Um, uh, Fort Laramie saw a lot um, over the time it was in operation uh, historically. Um, and in the late 1800s, the military from Fort Laramie often escorted Othniel March, Marsh, Yale's famous dinosaur hunter, on expeditions in the territory. Uh, Fort Laramie lies on the edge of the Denver Basin, a cratonic basin which developed between 75 to 35 million years ago during the Laramide orogeny. I, I threw this in because um, um, this uh, it's National Historic Trails Interpretive Center in Casper, Wyoming. It, it is one of the best museums I've ever been in. And uh, it, it tells the, the story of the, the settlers who were moving uh, across the plains and uh, all the trails, the California, Mormon, Oregon, Oregon, Bozeman Trail, and also the Pony Express uh, went through or near here. And uh, it really drove home what they endured. And of course, it all had to do with uh, the geology because of, uh, you know, ter the rough terrain, prairies, rivers, mountains, uh, where, where they were traveling. Uh, just, it just drove home to me how, uh, how we, ha we have to deal with geology, and, and they certainly had to. All right. Well, driving up Route 20 uh, on our way to Glacier, we um, uh, drove toward the Bighorn Basin. Uh, I just wanted to show you, uh, this is a, a Google Earth map, and you can clearly see the mountains around this uh, basin. Um, it's a plateau region and intermontane basin, approximately 100 miles wide in north central Wyoming. It is surrounded by mountain ranges. The largest cities in the basin include Cody, Thermopolis, and Grable, in addition to others. It forms a geologic structural basin filled with more than 20,000 feet of sedimentary rocks from Cambrian to Miocene in age. Since the early 20th century, the basin has been a significant source of petroleum and has produced more than 1,400,000,000 barrels of oil. The eastern section of the basin is famously rich in fossils with formations such as the Cretaceous period, Cloverleaf formation. The cloverleaf, cloverleaf formation, which outcrops in Wyoming and Montana, consists of variegated mudstones and sandstones deposited by streams, rivers, and shallow lakes. 
This is a big dinosaur hunting area. So we're heading toward uh, we're heading toward the Bighorn Basin. On our way um, toward the basin, then we drove through um, Wind River Canyon. This is a scenic byway, it follows Route 20 north through Wind River Canyon and Wind River Indian Reservation. Um, the Wind River Canyon is a crack in time, 17 miles long, 20 to 3,000 feet wide and 2,500 feet deep. The uh, road through the canyon has over 300 feet elevation climbs southward and crosses rocks recording about 3 billion years in time. That's, of course, what was interesting to me. It uh, is the best place to see Paleozoic and Precambrian rocks in Wyoming because of great exposures and easy highway access. Um, as we were driving, we were driving actually north toward, toward Thermopolis, which I had never heard of before this trip and didn't know anything about it. But uh, certainly we were driving past um, some uh, sedimentary beds here, and I, I took a snapshot of this, this bed. Uh, and of course, my, ma my matching <laughs> uh, Rock D screenshot. Um, the uh, it's part of the Chugwater group as a prime example of red beds commonly deposited during the Permian and Triassic periods. Um, I wanted to point out here that uh, this says Phosphoria formation, and up here I have red peak formation, and that is because there are lenses of the Phosphoria formation in the red peak formation. Um, it is composed of siltstone, claystone, and very fine grain sandstone. That is obviously reddish orange, although there's some other uh, colors occasionally in the formation. The red peak is 550 to 1,000 feet thick. The formation was influenced by plate tectonics and sea level fluctuations. It records seven cycles of regressive and transgressive units, showing how the shoreline of the water moved seaward or landward through the course of time. Most of the red peak formation was deposited during a desolate time in Earth's history. About 250 million years ago, just before the start of the Triassic period, a catastrophic event assured uh, that triggered the extinction of more than 90% of Earth's life. Starting at its base, most of the red peak formation is completely void of fossils, marking the aftermath of this mass extinction. Um, although toward the top of the formation, they, they were finding fossils. Then we arrived at Thermopolis. Um, we drove past Thermopolis because we didn't know what it was, had never heard of it before. It's a state park and we drove past it. Uh, you know, conversation in the, in the van, do you want to stop? Well, I don't know. Well, so we passed it and looking over my right shoulder, <laughs> I'm getting a glimpse of this, uh, what you're seeing here. And I, I said, I think we better turn around and go back. So we did, and um, it turned out to be what they bill themselves as the world's largest mineral hot springs, although there's a little debate about that, who is the largest, depends on how much water is flowing, who has the largest water overflow or the length of the uh, uh, formation, et cetera. So it's um, the warm spring waters flow upward along steep faults in the crest of a large anticline. They are warmed at the depths of about 6,000 feet by the natural geothermal gradient. This simplified model on the right of water flow at Thermopolis shows the water entering several layers in the Owl Creek Mountains, flowing down the side of the syncline to depths of about 6,000, then upwards into the Thermopolis anticline where some of it flows into the hot springs. The spring flows, spring, springs flow at the rate of 3,000 gallons per minute at a temperature of about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the bubbling action in the spring is caused by carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide gas. 
The springs emerge from the crest of the Thermopolis anticline, which is a large geologic fold that formed during the Laramide orogeny. Um, the Laramide mountain building event faulted and folded the red Triassic age rock layer seen around the hot springs. Um, and the hot water is thought to be traveling up to the surface along those faults. T-shirts and skirts. Uh, there's another shot, and here's uh, the, the different colors of the, the the algae and so forth in the water. Um, oh, next we came to the 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 town of Gray Bull, Wyoming. Um, Gray Bull, Wyoming, is um, a small town. Um, an older type of town. When as you're driving in, it doesn't didn't seem to us like there was a lot happening in the town. But I had looked on my phone and found uh, places you should see, and uh, one was the Bighorn Basin Geoscience Center. So we thought we would go see this, and here is you can see the Bighorn Basin Geoscience Center storefront is not hugely impressive. Um, it was, uh, I would say the building was probably a 1940s building and it was, you know, retrofitted. Uh, when you walk in the, the main door, it's just a hallway. Uh, and then on each side of the doorway, there are two rooms. On the one side, uh, it would have been like a storefront back in the old days. Um, and on the one side, uh, the, the door was open and in that side, they had all of the t-shirts and books and things you could buy and on the other side was just a very large room I would say it was about the size of two good sized classrooms just one large room with these fossils and uh, a lot of them now some of them had please don't touch but uh, a lot of them you could just touch and to to me it was like going to the Smithsonian only you could get really close to close to things and really examine things and touch some of the things. Over here, you can see my hand. So you can see the size of this creature. It, it was quite a, a, a jaw dropping place. That's in Gray Bowl. I have to say that um, there, there's some more shots of, of things in the Gray Bowl Museum. Hmm. And this is their uh, little poster that they had uh, hanging there uh, of their, their summer lecture series. And here were their speakers uh, this summer. Someone from Iowa State University, the Smithsonian, University of Michigan, and uh, someone from William Jewell College, and I'm thinking to myself, why are these people coming out to this little town in Wyoming? <laughs> and I asked the ladies, at the crazy woman, oh, by the way, when we walked into the museum, there was no one there. There was no, there was no admittance fees. Admittance fee, you just walk in. And there was no one there. So we were wondering, you could walk into the where they had the books and the t-shirts and then you could walk in and look at the fossils. And a lady came walking across the street from the crazy lady uh, trading post, crazy woman trading post. By the way, crazy woman is in historical reference. There's a crazy woman uh, creek and a crazy woman canyon. So it's it's an historical thing locally. So there's the, she came across from the crazy woman trading post and she said, Oh, she said, when they're not here, we run this too. If you need anything, just come across and tell us. So she left. <laughs> and um, I went over then later to the Crazy Woman Trading Post and I said, how, how do you get these people to come here, these speakers? And she said, well, we have somebody that calls them and they come. Okay. Uh, uh, and... Um, Later, we went down to, there's, there's another little museum in town, just a block down, it's at the library. Now at the library, they had things in clothes and cases and so forth. Uh, it wasn't huge, but, and I asked the librarian, I said, how do they 
how do they get people, these people to come in? Well, apparently, uh, not too far out of town there is where these people bring their students to dig for dinosaur bones. So uh, my guess is that these people are in the area with their students or you know, on digs. Um, and they will, of course, will do a, a presentation at the, at the library. Uh, well, I was pretty excited about that because I thought we might be able to go see a real dinosaur dig. And uh, the librarian said, uh, oh, you won't find them because he said, of course, they don't want everyone tromping around their, their digs. And as we drove out of town a little bit later, uh, with all the bluffs and the roads going back through the countryside, you, you, it would take a lot of hunting and you, you probably never would find them. It would take a long time. So that was that was an experience. Um, but we did uh, drive out of town um, and um, came to a sign that said uh, Devil's, well, Devil's Kitchen. And I just wanted to show you the kind of a geo map of this big, big hole in the ground. Devil's Kitchen. Now there are Devil's Kitchen several places in the West. So if you dial up Devil's Kitchen, you need to uh, make sure you have this one in Wyoming. And this is what it was. Now, um, the thing about Raj and I finding these out of the way places, here's a, it, uh, there's, a, there's a little sign leading back to Devil's Kitchen. And here's this giant, here's the giant hole in the ground. And we are the only ones there. Uh, it is a 115 acre geologic feature, five miles east of Graybull. Uh, structure is an asymmetrical anticline with early Cretaceous uh, cloverleaf formation exposed within the core. Um, an anticline is folded rock in the shape of an umbrella or an upside down ship's hull. At Devil's Kitchen, the top of the umbrella shape is eroded off so it resembles a cut onion. It is layered soft sedimentary rocks of stand, sandstone shale and claystone. Badlands all to yourself in unusual shapes and colors. With a little looking, you can find some dinosaur gizzard stones, gastroliths, and there is some attractive chalcedony. This type of formation is also found in the Painted Desert, and apparently, um, in my reading, I discovered uh, I haven't been to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, but apparently there's some of this there also. This type of landscape is constantly changing. Soft bentonite clay is easily eroded by wind and water. We did not climb down in there because um, it was starting to rain. You can see the you know clouds up there, and I think you can actually see some rain coming down up here. And our little camper is very heavy, and it does not like mud. It will get stuck in mud at the uh, at the least provocation, and um, we had to dr drive back dirt roads for. Um, a dirt road for, I think, five miles to get there. Uh, so my husband said, we can't get stuck out here. So we did not take the time to uh, to go down in there to do any collecting. Here are some other pictures of this site, Devil's Kitchen. It, it was truly like, like the painted desert, only it wasn't as large. I was delighted that I had service there on my phone because I so badly wanted to get this <laughs> to go with the devil's with the pictures, the devil's kitchen. And and I was I, I did have service. So this is these are the screenshots I took to go along with the uh, the photographs, Devil's Kitchen. And there's some more shots of it. Otherworldly. It's beautiful and jaw-dropping, really, these formations. Um, I wanted to include this, a bentonite, because uh, that bentonite clay is in the, the Badlands and, and those uh, painted desert. Um, bentonite is uh, called the clay of a thousand uses. 
Wyoming is the nation's leader in bentonite production with over 4 million tons produced each year. This is one of three production sites near the Bighorn Range. Wyoming has 70% of the world's known supply of bentonite. Wyoming's bentonite has unique characteristics that are rarely found anywhere else. It can swell up to 16 times its original size and absorbs up to 10 times its own weight in water. These characteristics are mostly due to the presence of sodium instead of calcium, which is more commonly found in bentonite. Geologists believe that the sodium in Wyoming's bentonite was created by high concentrations of sodium ions in the seawater where volcan uh, volcanic ash settled. Wyoming bentonite is the result of chemical changes in ancient volcanic ash which originated in Western Wyoming and Idaho about 120 million years ago during the late Cretaceous. Winds blew the ash into a shallow sea that covered most of what is now Montana and Wyoming. Present day exposures of the ash deposits are mined to an average depth of 25 feet in the Bighorn Basin and Powder River Basin and along the edges of the Black Hills. Bentonite has been called miracle mud and the clay of a thousand uses. Some of these uh, include some of the uses, absorbance, animal feed, drilling fluids, foundry, iron, uh, iron ore pelletizing, and sealants. Wyoming bentonite is particularly in demand for pet litter because of its ability to absorb many times its volume in water and control odors. Among other uses, bentonite is found in crayons, medication, and cosmetics, such as shampoos, lotions, face creams, and lipstick. Originally, Wyoming bentonite was used by local Indians as a bleaching clay and washing agent. Pioneers used it as a substitute for axle grease and to cure inflamed horse hooves and to waterproof the horse hooves. Uh, we next came in that same basin, the Bighorn Basin, to the Red Gulch Dinosaur Track Site. This is um, administered by the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit here to you directly from the site. At BLM's Red Gulch Dinosaur Track Site, you can imagine walking along an ocean shoreline 167 million years ago with dozens of dinosaurs who were looking to pick up a bite of lunch from what washed up on the last high tide. The, sand, the sandy ground is soft and your feet sink down in the thick ooze, leaving a clear footprint with every step you take. The track site is the largest track site in Wyoming and one of only a few worldwide from the middle Jurassic period, 160 to 180 million years ago. The Red Gulch track site is an assemblage of fossil dinosaur footprints on public land near the town of Shell in uh, the Bighorn County, Wyoming. They were discovered in just 1997. Until the tracks were found, most sci scientists thought the entire Bighorn Basin and most of Wyoming was covered by an ancient ocean called the Sundance Sea. Not only are there hundreds of tracks at the site, but the 40 acre site uh, it could, contain, could contain thousands more. The discovery altered the views about the Sundance formation and the paleo environment of the Middle Jurassic period in North America. Um, and uh, this site, you don't get to just look at it. You, you can walk. Here's the uh, ramp coming down. You can walk on this. They call this the dinosaur, the ballroom because the dinosaur tracks is just covered with dinosaur tracks. There's a, I, I, I just thought it was kind of cool to be able to touch a dinosaur track like that. And here, of course, my Rock D accompaniments to the photograph. Um, so then we did uh, get the glacier. And I wanted to uh, just uh, give you a little preliminary idea of the timeline here. Um, 
the geologic history of Glacier National Park stretches back nearly 2 billion years. The landscapes are a result of geolo uh, geologic processes, including erosion, deposition, uplift, faulting, folding, and of course, glaciation. The geologic history of Glacier National Park begins in the Proterozoic Eon, the early part of Earth's history before complex life inhabited the planet. Many rocks this old are not preserved at the Earth's surface today, having been eroded over time or been significantly changed significantly by metamorphism. However, at Glacier National Park, hundreds of millions of years of sedimentary rocks are preserved in the Belt Supergroup. Approximately 150 million years ago, plates of crust began to collide with the western edge of North America, resulting in a series of mountain building events, orogenies. These events had a profound effect on the surface geology of Glacier National Park. During the Sevier orogeny, about 105 million years ago, sheets of rock were thrust westward about 300 miles along a thin skinned thrust fault where just the upper layers of Earth's crust were transported at a low angle movement. Evidence of the Sevier orogeny can be seen in the mountains at Glacier National Park. In contrast to the Sevier orogeny, the Laramide orogeny, which began in Lake Cretaceous, was thick skinned. Um, meaning it occurred along faults that had nearly vertical fault planes and displaced rocks thousands of feet thick. So we're starting way back here. All right. During the Laramide orogeny, uh, the Lewis Thrust Fault became the central plane of movement of the massive rock column of the, super, of the Belt Supergroup. The Lewis Thrust Fault is perhaps Glacier National Park's most famous geological feature. Before the Laramide orogeny, the Belt Supergroup was buried below thick layers of Cretaceous rock, deposited during a time of rich prehistoric plant and animal life. During this event, the Belt Supergroup rocks were pushed up and over these Cretaceous rocks along the Lewis Thrust Fault. Throughout the period of uplift, Rock was folded and faulted, forming interesting geologic formations like synclines and anticlines. When the belt supergroup was uplifted, the rock layers from the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic above them were exposed and then eroded away and are no longer present in the park. The Laramide orogeny ended about 35 million years ago. After that, the fault system between the Pacific and North American plates began to grow which triggered extensional deformation of the North American plate, including land extending to the Northeast. In Glacier National Park, these events are evidenced by the presence of normal faults in contrast to the thrust faults of the Laramide orogeny. Um, these are just a few of the, the shots from Glacier and you can surely see all this uh, sedimentary layers. Um, 1.6 billion to 800 million years ago, the majority of the rocks forming the mountains in Glacier National Park are a result of the sediments and, uh, and the uplifting. However, the, the, the original, all of the original um, fault, the, the, uh, the uh, parts that were thrust up over are eroded away. So what, what we're actually seeing is what it pushed up over, which is why this was so well preserved. It was covered by, by the uh, rock layers. And then of course, uh, as it was exposed, then uh, glaciation had a lot to do with it. What we're seeing today. I, I am particularly myself interested in the early geology of park, not so much the glaciation. That's why I concentrated on it. Uh, 
um, in walking over uh, through the, the trails, uh, it was amazing to me that as you're walking along, you see uh, evidence of the sedimentary formations all along. Ripple rocks with ripples everywhere, uh, mud cracks, and of course here are uh, striations from uh, glaci glaciation. You don't have to look hard to find those; they're right along the trail. Our delight is a fine-grained sedimentary rock composed predominantly uh, of clay particles. Agrilaceous rocks are basically lithified muds and oozes, which would have been in the bottom of the uh, of the sea, where this uh, all this sedimentary uh, rock mud was laid down. Another name for poorly lithified argillites is mudstone. The metamorphism of argillites produces slate, phyllite, and holistic politic schist. Uh, one thing that was um, notable in the glacier was the colors, the different colors of the stones. Uh, there's this is a, a a stream, so that's why it looks like this. But you can see the uh, the greens and the oranges here. Someone uh, had uh, collected some of the stones and, and laid them out in rows in this little section. Um, perhaps one of the most eye-catching uh, features of glacier is the varying shades of red and green. Different layers of rock in glacier can be dramatically different colors and their color can tell us a great deal about their history. The process that created these striking colors centers around one element, iron. The argillite in the park throughout its formation contains significant amounts of iron, which is of course a reactive metal. Much like an old car, Iron will oxidize or rust and turn reddish when exposed to oxygen. We all know that. So that explains the red color. Conversely, but uh, you know, where did the green come from? Well, this was new information to me. The green found in the rocks is a result of argillite forming without access to oxygen. Forming underwater in the Belt Sea, argillite starved of oxygen instead goes through a process known as reduction with iron bonding to silica compounds. Under heat and pressure, the iron silicate minerals were converted to chlorite, a mineral which produced the green rocks found in the park today. So the red rocks were, of course, when the mud was exposed to oxygen, which would have been a, a shallower, uh, when it in shallower sea. And the green was when it was, it was deeper and um, uh, lack of oxygen. Um, uh, then we left Glacier National Park and I, I we did a drive through Spearfish Canyon. Um, I threw this in here. <laughs> because it was raining that day. It was pouring, pouring, pouring rain. Um, it was a beautiful canyon. And here are my rock D to go with it. Um, and we, but, uh, and my my thing here is uh, how badly do you want to collect a rock? Well, we found a stream, a dried stream bed. We lose you there, Diana.
I don't, I think we lost Diana here. Uh, We'll see if she comes back on uh, online here. Uh, looking over some of your apps you put into the chat room. Uh, Read Grid is a good one. And Andrew mentioned. Shows the property lines and who owns the property. Uh, or basically anything in the in the United States, actually. It's a free app. Uh, Steve Lindbergh mentioned the IRIS, which is the earthquake uh, network. Hey, that was a neat trip she was talking about there, Jerry. I hope she gets back on. Yeah, she like froze up there. And then... Uh, Sharing, sharing stopped. So she must have gotten kicked off. But yeah, they do. Uh, as, as you see, Diana does a great job with Rock D. I live that by that. And Melanie, you have anything you want to add at this point to see if See if Diana gets back here. Uh, I don't believe so on topic. Um, however, uh, park wise, if anyone is looking for a best fall festive uh, Halloween event to go to this Saturday at six o'clock, we are having a night at the nature center Ooh. event at Nixon park where it's like night at the museum where all the animals come, come alive. Uh, talking about nocturnal animals and all the lights will be off and it'll be a little bit spooky. Ooh. Yeah. Oh no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all that I'll throw that out there for anyone in the area with grandkids or nieces or nephews or any other kind of family who would want to attend an event like that. Can I come and get scared? If you can handle it. <laughs> You think I can? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you want to put a plug in for the other thing I sent out for you? Sure, sure. So Jerry sent out an email um, that I had composed and sent to uh, several of the volunteers that I manage about a local author visit. Um, his name is Dr. Anthony Fredericks. He was a uh, past York College professor uh, in literature and he is a naturalist himself. However, he's kind of formed his career um, being a naturalist and writing it down and putting it on paper. So he is an award-winning author. He has written several children's books as well as adult books. Um, his newest publication just, come out, just came out uh, earlier this month in early October. Um, it is a book, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, amongst uh, the Ancient Ones. It is a story about um, ancient trees, uh, but trees that aren't just a couple years old, but trees that are like thousands of years old. Um, so uh, it is very interesting. He has traveled all around the country to do research so that all of his writing is uh, accurate of what he had seen in person. It's kind of like a time travel type story of what that tree would have witnessed throughout its lifetime, as well as what it looks like today. Um, so he is going to give a presentation at Nixon Park about this newest book, about these ancient trees. And uh, following the presentation, he'll have a, a little meet and greet and a book signing. Uh, hopefully we get them in in time, but hopefully we will have books um, that visitors can purchase and get signed. So that is on November 5th at two o'clock at Nixon Nature Center. So that should be a blast. I'm really looking forward to that. Okay. I'm not seeing Diana coming back on here. Somebody just left. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to make an executive decision here and, uh, 
we're going to bring this this session to an end. Uh, unfortunately, you're not able to ask Diane any, any questions. That you know, if you had any questions for her, um, I'm just trying to think how we can do that. Uh, actually, I think what I'll do, I'll I will send out by email uh, Diana's email. Oh, wait a minute. He's trying to get back in here. Oh, she just left. Apparently, he's having trouble. Um, what I will do is send out Diana's email address. Oh, Jerry. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. I'm back in. I think I, apparently my computer overheated. Okay. Um. You're getting close to the end, right? Yes, um, and I—I I mean, that can be the end if, if uh, it looks like we're. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if you want me to finish or not. I just had a couple. Uh, I was just—I was just getting ready to tell tell them I was going to email your email address out. If they have any questions, but if anybody has any questions for Diana now. Put them into the chat room and uh, Mel can read them or if Diana can see them, whatever. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just end your program now because it's, it's 8, 12 now. If that's okay with you. Oh, sure. I uh, apologize to everyone. I I do have an older computer and I guess it overheated. I had a, did have a participant say that was a, a good program. You were, you were taking them on. <laughs> uh, anybody have any questions about what you saw? Uh, we went over the apps while you were going, Diane, about the Regrid app, which is the app that shows the uh, property owners and the property lines on all, all the properties in the United States. Steve Lindbergh mentioned, of course, Iris, which is the uh, earthquake uh, network, uh, earthquake seismic wave simulator uh, apps that he uses. Darren, I just saw a question. Where is that? What part of Glacier National Park were you in? We drove, we uh, did the going to the Sun Road. Uh, we drove drove that, and then um. We went to the other side and um, uh, did some hikes within the park. I'd have to go back and into my notes. Okay. Uh, I, we had um, three days there. Um, I, I wish I would have had more time and a lot of that time was spent um, entertaining grandchildren <laughs> and, and and having fun with grandchildren. So uh, I I wasn't just doing geology, uh, in the, in, <laughs> you know, in the same way. Right. Did you go to Devil's Tower? No, I don't think so. At all? Okay. You, you, yeah, you would know if you went there. That was just another question. Okay. Uh... I I did have a, a, a I was so close to being finished, and we did uh, find some clinkers on our way home. I oh, that's that right. Was, that was the geologic surprise clinkers. So if anyone wants to look up what a clinker is, we were driving along the. Um, I just I just actually did have. Um, two more slides uh, and it was about the clinkers. So we're driving along the plains, which is flat grassland. And all of a sudden we come up on these giant boulder type things that are, you know, are as tall as I, and some of them strange looking, strange looking things. So um, you can look up what a clinker is. It's where um, a coal bed catches fire. And, um, kind of like in Centralia. So it kind of bakes, it bakes the uh, rocks around it and then makes them um, 
of course, less subject to erosion. So everything around them erodes, and this baked these baked rocks, giant baked rocks, are just laying there. That was that was a that was that was a geologic surprise for me. There you go. <laughs> We like to find geologic surprises. Okay, I had a request. They want to see your last two slides, Diana. So, oh, show okay. us the show us the uh, the clinkers. All right. <laughs> do we have it here? Hold on a second. I do have it queued up. Share screen. There it is. And play. Okay, let me just go down through here. Okay, just close your eyes for a minute. <laughs> oh, there we go. There they are. They're the clinkers. <laughs> um, they were on the plateau which uh, part of Wyoming is the Missouri Plateau. And uh, you can see in the colors there, which, so that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, this is what it looks like up close. The result of a, a seam of coal catching fire uh, and baking, baking the ground around it. This is a piece I brought home. It's the same piece, just from different angles. And this one's, uh, I got up closer to it. But this, look, this to me, looks like wood. And of course, in a coal bed, I believe there could have been pieces of wood. What do you think, Jerry? Oh, yeah, sure. Fossilized. Yep. Fossilized wood. And this is what it looked like on the other side. So whatever um, type of rock was laying around this uh, coal bed when it caught fire was baked. I actually have I actually have heard that used in northern Pennsylvania in our coal regions. Okay. Well, well it's kind of a um, a fun thing to um, drive across, uh, drive, you know, notice and then investigate what it was. That's what I like to do. Right. And that was it. That was um, here. Geologists are never at a loss for paperweights. <laughs> By Bill Bryson. Happy rock hunting wherever you roam. And that was the. Uh, I was so close to the end. <laughs> Just couldn't quite get there. You had to put another quarter in the machine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I best I can say is it overheated and then I had to get back in again. And of course it took it a minute to cool down. So. All right. I guess your, uh, your, your, your grandkids weren't in the room tonight, were they? Um, well, the three hour time difference is, uh, oh, that's right. That's, that was the problem. Uh, so, uh, I think they're going to be looking at it later in the, uh, in the recording. Video. Okay. Hey, thanks for doing that. That great program. Uh, obviously the people will appreciate the, the uh, participants appreciate and enjoyed your, your trip through, uh, the West there. So, uh, thank you. Melanie, you have time to stay here after everybody leaves? I sure do. I want to talk to you about future. All righty. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, nothing else said. We're going to see you in two weeks from tonight. November the 7th is the next Zoom room. First Tuesday of November. That is Election Day. Also... So I know everybody wants to get off of here and watch the uh, the Philadelphia Phillies baseball game. That's uh, has started by now. I think I don't have it on here myself yet, but uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. So uh, we thank you for coming on board tonight. As, as always, the show was videotaped. It will be on uh, 
jonesdo.com within a couple of hours. Go back and watch it. And uh, Diana, you did a super job as always. You never seem to, you never seem to uh, fail me. So uh, keep up all that good work you're doing out there for geology and astronomy too. Thank you. So well, uh, we'll see everybody. I guarantee you, in two weeks from tonight. Okay. Uh, have fun. See everybody then. You can probably stop recording then. Oh yeah. I guess I can. I usually shut <laughs> off when I.